there we go. I had to get ready here. Going live. Okay, here it is. We're, we're October. This is like week 12 of our semester. So we've only got about four weeks left, and now it's time for our third test of the semester for two of my classes. So I've got questions from both 1140 and Bio 303, which is the college and evolution, of course, the evolution part. And I'm going to do these together. So really quickly, I've gotten a couple uh, great questions already online. And these are from the Bio 1140, which is Biology for Health Related Sciences. And let me answer those questions first. And then as people start sending me questions, we can uh, go over the ones mostly for evolution class. But if 1140, if you're on there too, don't hesitate to jump right in. One of the first questions I got is, why is heat the lowest form of energy? That's a really good question, actually. You know, uh, heat is basically, we measure that as temperature. And temperature is a measure of the average uh, thermal energy of molecules. So heat, as something gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the thermal energy increases. But this is a form of kinetic energy. So these little molecules are moving faster and faster and faster but they're moving randomly. So as you heat something up, uh, yeah, you increase the total amount of energy in that system, but it's random, so you really can't uh, harness that energy to do work. And because you can't harness it to do work, it's a low form of energy, so it has what we call high entropy. Okay, another one. What would happen to the citric acid cycle if you didn't have NAD and FAD, if they weren't present? That's a fantastic question. For those of you studying cellular respiration, basically NAD and FAD, those are your electron carriers. So when you have the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, what you're doing is you're oxidizing organic materials. And because you're oxidizing them, you're removing electrons from them. So if you didn't have NAD or FAD, H2, which are your electron carriers, basically the electron, the, I'm sorry, the, the citric acid cycle would stop you would stop oxidizing those molecules and you wouldn't get any oxidative phosphorylation. Basically aerobic respiration would stop and you'd only get ATP through uh, um, glycolysis, which would be substrate level phosphorylation. And of course, the next question is, what's the difference between substrate level and oxidative phosphorylation? First of all, substrate level phosphorylation occurs in glycolysis and in the Krebs cycle you get a total of like four ATPs for that. And substrate um, level phosphorylation is basically you have an enzyme uh, that's coupled to an exergonic reaction to make ATP, whereas oxidative phosphorylation is you're using the whole electron transport chain mechanism along with uh, chemiosmosis. And of course, this last question is what's happening to the PhD in the inner membrane? Well, as you're pumping protons into the inner membrane, you drop the pH, so the pH lowers as it becomes more and more acidic inside the inner membrane. Okay, now let's see. I've got another question here. It comes in. If we can understand time better and what the scale of billions of years really means, do you think we will discover the Earth and thus life is even older than we currently think? That's a really good question. Um, it took uh, a long time to figure out the age of the Earth. For instance, uh, it, you know, people really had no idea. And then in the early 1800s, Lyell came out with principles of geology that Darwin read. And in that, Lyell and another guy named Hutton were proposing this idea of uniformitarianism. Basically, that you know, the, the, how geology operates today operates the same in the past. It operates the same in the, in the, in the present, the future, and everywhere. So basically, if, it, if you're building a mountain range at one inch a year, when you go back a million years, you're, you're still building mountain ranges at about an inch a year. You're not doing anything really differently. And from that, they realized the Earth was, you know, millions of years old. They had no idea it was billions. It took the um, the advent of uh, understanding radioactivity and the decay and, and measuring half-lives for many different types of radioactive or radioisotopes. And once they discovered radioactivity, it still took another 50 years for them to kind of pin down that the age of the earth was 4.6 billion years. That age almost certainly will not change that much. We, it might fluctuate a few tens of millions of years as we, as we refine it, but 4.6, 4.65 is really um, 
is about pretty accurate. Now, that one about the age of life on the earth. Oh, yeah, that's going to probably change. Uh, for decades, it's been uh, estimated that um, life is about 3.5 billion years old. Uh, we've got good evidence now that it's 3.8 billion years old. And there's also compelling evidence from isotopic uh, signatures that life may have been around as early as 4.1 billion years ago. So, yeah, um, life on the Earth might be older than we think. And I tend to fall in the camp that life has probably been around for longer than 4 billion years. We just don't have the solid smoking gun evidence of it. Okay. So the next question, how does evolution support Linnaean classification? You know, that's a really good question too. So basically Linnaean classification, you know, you got kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That's a hierarchy of life going from kingdom, which is the most inclusive. I mean, like think of like all animals are in the animal kingdom all the way down to species level, which is the least inclusive. And but that classification that Linnaeus came up with is based on similarities. So the more closely related you are, the more similar you are. So animals in a of different species in the same genus are look very similar. If you're all talking about animals, I mean, think about like birds and humans and insects and spiders and snails and slugs. We're really different, but we share a lot in common, including germ layers, developmental issues. We uh, we we all feed by ingestion. We have Hox genes. We have bilateral symmetry. We have a nervous system and we move by muscles. We share all of that in common because we have a common ancestry. So the reason that Darwin came up with this idea that species evolve over time, but we descended from common ancestors. Well, the further back your ancestor is, the more time you've had to diverge. What that means is, look at Linnaean classification. If you're a different species in the same genus, you probably had a recent common ancestor and you are more similar. If you look at all animals, well, we, we, we still share similarities, but we look really different. Just think like a human and a spider. We look really different because we haven't shared an ancestor in over 550 million years. But because we did come from an ancestor, we still share similarities. So you can still classify us as an animal. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Another great, man, you guys are coming up with such good questions today. Could you go over why the fossil record can support evolution even though it's incomplete? Fantastic question. You know, the fossil record, a lot of people that don't really buy into evolution, they uh, they point to the fossil record being incomplete. Well, you know what? Uh, it actually completely supports evolution because evolution says, you know, species are changing over time. We are seeing a descent with modification. So in the, in the fossils, what happens is you... Um, you have the youngest layers on, on, on the top and you go through a progression of older and older and older layers. So by the time you get to the bottom, you're your oldest fossils. And what we see in the fossil record, even though it's incomplete, is we see a clear progression of change over time. And we don't what we do not see in the fossil record is jumbled up chronology, meaning the fossil record, if we go back 550 million years, we find trilobites. If we go back 530 million years ago, we see the ancestors to um, all uh, to like mollusk. We see ancestors to vertebrates, but we do not see a rabbit next to a trilobite. We do not see rabbits next to dinosaurs. We see this clear progression over time. So even though the fossil record is largely incomplete and biased toward things that have hard parts like shells and bones and teeth, it still fully supports evolution because it shows that clear progression over time and does not show a jumbled up um, fossils all over the place. Okay. Could you argue that allopatric speciation is more common than sympatric speciation because of uniformitarianism? Huh? Yeah, I don't know, actually. I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. We, we typically think allopatric speciation is the more common mode of, of speciation because the reason why is because if you're if you have two populations in different regions we can easily imagine how barriers to gene flow could easily arise 
let, uh, for instance, fish in different lakes. Well, they can't just get up and walk across the, the, the land to go to the new lake. So that creates a barrier to gene flow or, you know, the creation of islands and you're caught on an island. That's a, 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 a barrier to gene flow for a lot of organisms or the Grand Canyon. All of these physical barriers create gene flow. So we tend to think of allopatric speciation as the much more common mode of speciation, much more than sympatric speciation. So I'm going to move on. Okay. Are there constraints on natural selection? Yes. Well, yes, there are. Uh, basically, we call it the ghost of evolutionary past. Um, natural selection has to work with what is already there. And you can think of it as tinkering with what you have. So for instance, uh, you know, you're not going to easily get a human starting to fly. We don't have, um, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. We, we don't have mechanisms to get us like flying or something. Uh, so there are constraints, you know, you can't just reinvent. It's very difficult to totally reinvent the wheel all the time. Once, and once you start going down a certain path, uh, in, in an evolutionary trajectory, it can be hard to go away from that path too. So, you know, and when you're also dealing with, um, let me think of how to say this. Yeah, the constraints on natural selection, they're definitely there. I'm sorry I'm not answering this very well. Um, I'm a little off my game today. I'm trying to think. I'll come back to that one. i sorry about that. Okay. How does one polyploidy? Well, um, <laughs> that's pretty funny. How does one polyploidy? So let's take this word and break it down. Poly means many. Ploidy has to do with chromosome count. So whenever we're talking about polyploidy, we're talking about lots of chromosomes. And I think what you're asking here is you can get a speciation event. You can create a new species in one generation by polyploidy. So think about it this way. You know, we're all diploid. We got a, a copy of our chromosomes from one from our mom and a copy from our dad. You put them together, we are diploid because our gametes, the sperm and the egg, are both haploid, 23 chromosomes in each. Put them together, here we are. We got 46 diploid. In a lot of plants, what happens every now and then, they will create a gamete that is diploid. So basically, it's a failure of meiosis to separate out the homologous chromosomes or even the sister chromosomes as, or the sister chromatids as well. And what happens is you end up with a, well, yeah, you, you're not separating out the homologous chromosome, sorry. That way your, your gamete remains diploid. And if you're, if you're doing that in the same plant and you have these diploid gametes and they fuse, they're gonna form a tetraploid offspring. And that tetraploid offspring is has polyploidy. It's got multiple uh, copies of the chromosomes, in this case, four. And because it has um, four copies of each of its chromosomes, it has a different chromosome count than the parents. And as a result, that's a, a barrier to gene flow. And it happens in one generation so that if there's enough of those offspring, they start interbreeding and forming a population, you have a new species. And that clearly happens in nature. It happens a lot to firms. Okay. Can you please define uniformitarianism and how this principle was important for Darwin's understanding for the age of the earth? Okay, great. So uniformitarianism is an ism. So uniformitarianism, think about if you're wearing a uniform, it means everything's the same. Uniformitarianism came from geology where these Lyell and these early geologists, they were like, hey, you know, the, the, the processes of geology, mountain building, erosion, they are going to occur at the same rate right now. They're going to occur at the same rate everywhere in the world, and they're going to occur at the same rate in the past. And what they realized was that the earth was old, really old, millions of years old. So what Darwin reading Lyle's principles of geology realized that the earth was very old, which would give time for evolution of, by natural selection to work you have time for the slow grinding pace of natural selection to change species. And uh, now that being said, they grossly underestimated the age of the earth. Darwin had no idea that the earth was actually 4 billion years old. That didn't come out until the, you know, the 1930s or 40s or even the 1950s. 
but at least they move from a young earth hypothesis that the earth was, you know, thousands of years old. But by understanding uniformitarianism, they realize the earth is probably um, at least millions of years old. Okay. What is the difference between a law and a theory? That's a really good question. And, uh, you know, there's going to be somebody out there and especially some philosopher that's probably going to disagree with me. But for this class, here's the best way to think of it. A law tells you what's going to happen under the same circumstances. Think about the law of gravity. I got a pin right here. I'm going to drop it. And I'm going to drop it. And I'm going to drop it. And every time I drop that pin, what's going to happen is that pin is going to fall at 9.8 meters per second squared every single time. That's Newton's law of gravity. Newton's law of gravity says, hey, Every time you drop an object on Earth, it's going to fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. The laws of thermodynamics, they govern energy transformation. You can't create or destroy energy. But, you know, every time you, you use energy, you increase entropy. Those are laws. They tell you what's going to happen. A theory is an explanation for how things work. So we can think of, like, gravity. There's a law that describes, you know, that something's going to fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. But you could go... Um, well, what is gravity? What is this force that's pulling the pin to, to the earth? And that's where like general theory of relativity where Einstein said, you know, um, objects of mass curve space time. So this law of gravity, which is basically the general theory of relativity explains how gravity works. We could flip this back to biology. You know, we've got evolution as a fact, species change over time. We can observe it, we can measure it, and we can we can test for it. Evolution by natural selection is a theory because it explains how species change over time. Natural selection is a mechanism of change. And one thing that's important about scientific theories is that scientific theories enjoy very broad support from both experiments and or observations. They're not like untested. They're not... Uh, they, they're not just some harebrained scheme, and but in science, theories have had some support, and they they enjoy, and they have yet to be refuted. Okay. Can you explain if and why Lamarck's hypothesis for evolution was valid? Okay. Yeah, it was a valid scientific hypothesis. It was a wrong hypothesis, but it was valid. Lamarck proposed acquired characteristics for a mechanism of evolution. And if you remember acquired characteristics, remember that that thing about the uh, not the dinosaur, the giraffe trying to reach his head up to to grab up higher in the tree, you know, stretch, stretch that neck. And the idea of acquired characteristics is what happens to the parents is passed on to the next generation. This is actually a valid scientific hypothesis in the fact that it was testable and falsifiable. And it, it turned out you can test for acquired characteristics. We don't see it. So it's been falsified. So it's not a legitimate mechanism of evolution. But hey, Lamarck threw out, you know, and nobody's even really thinking about evolution, was like actually throwing out a testable hypothesis for the theory of evolution, for evolution. Okay. What are the predictions of evolution by natural selection? Hmm. Well, if you're evolving by natural selection, that means that that population is adapting to its environment and that you're going to what's going to happen over time is you're going to accrue. You're going to gain favorable alleles in that population that improve the overall fitness of that population for whatever it's doing in that environment. And uh, you're probably over time going to get rid of one of alleles that don't work as well. So that's a really good prediction of evolution by natural selection. It's going to cause things to change unless you have stabilizing selection, then it's going to keep them from changing. What is Archaeopteryx? Google it. It's a really cool fossil bird. That's a transition between birds and dinosaurs, at least supposedly. Uh, it's, it's this animal that can fly. It has, it has feathers. It could fly. It's 150 million years old, but it also has uh, characters of dinosaurs. It has bony tails. It's got claws in its wings. And most terrifyingly, it has uh, teeth in its bill. Uh, you know, birds today don't have teeth. Uh, they actually have latent genes or pseudogenes to grow teeth. But this Archaeopteryx, it actually was this flying 
half dinosaur, half bird-like transitional animal with teeth and a bony tail and feathers. Pretty cool. Why is allopatric speciation more common than sympatric speciation? That's a fantastic question. Uh, it probably because we can find allopatric speciation all the time, and we can actually it's easy, much easier to observe and find than sympatric speciation. And plus, we know that once you separate two populations physically, that is a very easy barrier for gene flow. Remember, speciation is built on gene flow. Um, so sympatric speciation, it's a bit harder for us to imagine scenarios or to test or find scenarios where populations are diverging or they're cohabitating. Now, in class, I went over a whole bunch of different ways of how you can get sympatric speciation from like sexual selection, disruptive selection, temporal isolation, mechanical isolation, behavioral isolation. Those things can all operate sympatrically to cause it. And it's a lot. But uh, we, we definitely think that allopatric species are more common just because it's much easier to find. Okay, can you please describe the source sink populations? Okay, imagine you've got a whole bunch of populations. That's a meta population. Think about you got a, a mountains around here. And larger mountains are, have, have more trees, thicker forests, and might be like better habitat for certain birds. And then smaller mountains might have less forest, less habitat, and might not be quite the perfect habitat for some birds. And as a result, that would be a sink, whereas the larger, better habitat would be a source. So if you were to think about like the Sandias, the Manzanos, the Magdalenas, and Mount Taylor and the Jemez, you might be like, oh yeah, you know, man, the, the Sinker de Cristos are huge they're 400 miles long the sandias are much smaller you could imagine like some of the birds that live in the sangre de cristos might be a great source population for ones in the sandias which are a much smaller mountain range and they might even be another source for like the manzanas or even mount taylor which is only a single mountain and that those could be more of a sink population so source populations are often producing enough individuals that they migrate away from the sources and they migrate to the sinks and if you cut off migration to a sink population, it might go away. So they're usually being bolstered by the uh, um, by the sources. Okay. What are the major consequences of mass extinction? Well, there's a couple of them, but one of the big consequences is whenever you have a mass extinction, you're wiping out over half of all the life on this planet or at least animal life that we can see, plant life too, so the visible life. Um, <clears throat> when you do that, you basically create a whole bunch of new niches, a new, a lot of open space for niches so for animals to, to rapidly diversify. So let me give you a couple examples here of how mass extinctions have affected things. The worst mass extinction in history was 251 million years ago. It was the end of the Paleozoic, end of the, and it's called the P the PT boundary, the Permian-Triassic boundary, wiped out like 90% of all sea life, 70% of all life on land. 253 million years ago, the ancestors to mammals, which were called synapsids, were like the most dominant land animal. But they all got wiped out. And then uh, you had this mass extinction. And then around 230 million years ago, the new dominant land animal was dinosaurs, not the ancestors to mammals. And then for... Gosh, the next 170 million years, dinosaurs ruled the ruled the world, and um, mammals evolved, but they evolved in um, the shadow of the dinosaurs. They couldn't compete with the larger dinosaurs that are already there. Well, 65 and a half million years ago, giant meteor hits the Earth, and uh, there was some volcano volcanism as well, and the dinosaurs went extinct. And after the dinosaur extinction, we all know the story. Mammals then uh, became the dominant land animals. So mass extinctions can remove animals that are well established. And then after that, you make room for new diversification after that. Okay. Can you explain how disruptive selection can lead to sympatric speciation? Okay. So disruptive selection. Let's, let's draw it out. 
see if I can get my pen to work here. That's not working very well. Okay, I'm recycling some paper here. So I can get this. Disruptive selection. Let's see if this is working here. Okay, disruptive selection. You're 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 choosing for these two peaks here. So you've got two different forms. And imagine like a beach mouse, or you know you got they're white on the beach, but then in the trees, you know in the in the woods behind the sand dunes, they're they're brown, right? Let me make sure I get this there. We can see this. So you've got two peaks for selection. So it, selection is natural selection is working to either maintain white or brown mice, but but nothing in between. You don't want to be between white and brown because then if you're if you're kind of tan, you're going to stick out in the woods and you're going to get eaten by an owl or whatever predators out there. And if you're tan on the white beach, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. So in this case, you've got disruptive selection on these two different morphs of the of these mice. Well, you can imagine uh, a little bit of gene flow. Stop the gene flow here, and then this group you stop intermingling with these guys. And then what happens is you get sympatric speciation. These guys stop mingling with each other. And then uh, this population becomes isolated and no longer has the, the brown allele and just has a white allele. And then you get a new species. So that's one way that disruptive selection can lead to uh, speciation. Okay. What are the difficulties with applying a species concept to every living organism? Yeah, um, because you have to encounter things like prokaryotes, which include the archaea and bacteria. They reproduce asexually, but they also have lots and lots of lateral gene transfer. So they're picking up genes all over the place. Um, you've got to encounter mammals, and, I mean, sorry, animals in general that both reproduce sexually and asexually. You know, there are things out there that reproduce by parthenogenesis. We have lizards in New Mexico. They're all female. They don't have any males. They reproduce by parthenogenesis. So how do you apply a species concept to that, a biological species concept to that? So different organisms from animals, plants, to single-celled prokaryotes, um, it's really difficult to come up with a single unifying uh, species concept. The most commonly used one in the public and in the Endangered Species Act, of course, is the biological species concept, which is based on reproductive isolation. Well, if you're a population of all female lizards reproducing by parthenogenesis, well, how do you call that a species? Is each one its own species? Because each female is reproductively isolated, right? Uh, and then if you're asexually reproducing like bacteria, I mean, it, 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 it's almost meaningless. If you're using a morphological species concept, works great on fossils, you're gonna miss cryptic species and uh, you're gonna totally miss out on, uh, on bacterial species. I mean, when I was in high school, there was like 6,000 species of bacteria and now there's probably millions because they're so varied in their metabolism. So it can be really difficult to apply a single species concept to every living thing. The best one we have is the is a phylogenetic, phylogenetic species concept because we can apply that to um, fossils. We can apply that to cryptic species. We can apply that to things that are reproduced sexually and asexually. And we can somewhat apply it to prokaryotes, uh, although they have a lot of gene transfer, but so it makes it a little bit difficult, but it, it's the best thing we have. Okay. Let's see. Can you explain further the difference between genetic drift and gene flow? That's a good question. Genetic drift and gene flow. Okay, gene flow, imagine I've got two populations. I've got these bright blue um, Stellar's Jays on the Sandias, and I've got Stellar's Jays on Mount Taylor, and I've got Stellar's Jays just south of us in the Manzano Mountains. And what's happening is they rarely move between those mountains. However, every now and then, a Stellar's Jay from the Sandias might fly to the Manzanos, and with it, it might bring a new set of alleles. That would be an example of gene flow. Whenever you have a population of populations, a meta population, think of like birds living on all these mountains out here, and a bird from the Sandias decides it's gonna trek all the way 70 miles west of here to, um, to Mount Taylor, it's gonna bring a new set of alleles with it, 
and that's going to represent gene flow. So gene flow, it does change the allele frequencies in a population, but if you're dealing with a meta population, you know, a whole bunch of populations of one species, it will keep each one of those populations from diverging. Okay, now genetic drift is a little bit different. Genetic drift is another mechanism of evolution. Genetic drift is a random change in allele frequencies. It is not due to selection. It is totally random. Genetic drift uh, is a problem because you can randomly lose alleles and the population becomes homozygous for a particular gene, which means there's only one version of that gene. So here's an example of genetic drift. Imagine we have our classroom, we, we pluck it up and we put it on an oceanic island. And you know everybody has, well, the population, there's A, B, and O blood alleles. That's our genetic diversity for that particular blood type. Genetic drift over time, if we were to come back in a thousand years, everybody might be A blood because O and B were randomly lost. That'd be an example of genetic drift. There's no natural selection acting on it. And we could have just as easily ended up everybody B blood or everybody O blood. And in that case, you've lost genetic diversity and everybody's become homozygous for that particular allele. I mean, for that particular gene. So that's what genetic drift is. It's just this random change in your allele frequencies. And like I said, one of the, the consequences of that in a small population is you can randomly lose alleles, either beneficial or deleterious. It can, it can purge deleterious alleles. It can just as easily fix them. Okay. Let's see. Ah, can you please explain why we can study fruit flies to understand our own genetics? That's a fantastic question. You know, why, why do we spend millions of dollars studying worms, flies, and mice? I mean, I even heard a politician one time said, you know, this is ridiculous. We're spending millions of dollars spending on studying worms and flies. Well, it turns out that the reason why we can study fruit flies to understand our own genetics is common ancestry. You go back far enough, 550, 600 million years ago, and fruit flies and humans had a common ancestor, some animal like organism living in the ancient oceans. And basically that ancestor's genes work the same way as ours. They have four base pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. They have the exact same codons. Their genetic code is the same. They reproduce their DNA the same way. They have um, fruit flies regulate their genes the same way. They have Hox genes too. So it's easy to study fruit flies to understand our own um, genes because we shared a common ancestor and basically fruit flies, their genes work basically the same as ours. It goes back to common ancestry. It's kind of nice. That's why we only have to learn like one eukaryotic cell in class, right? That's why I have to learn one, one way that DNA replicates. Let's see here. Okay. Can you explain reproductive isolation? Okay, reproductive isolation is basically, um, let me think about how to answer that. I'm gonna come back to that one. But basically reproductive isolation is where um, two organisms can no longer interbreed. Now that could be because of allopatry, because well, they're, they're in just two, the two populations are in, are in two different regions and they can't, they can't mix. You could also have different types of isolating mechanisms. You could have, um, most of them we think about are the prezygotic ones, differences in behavior. You know, if you don't have the right song and dance, you're not gonna mate with a female. Uh, it could be mechanical like the snails. If your snail shells are the wrong direction, you can't line up. So uh, behavioral, mechanical, um, oh, there are some other ones. Sorry, I'm getting tired here. Um, yeah, temporal. So if you've got two trout and living in the same stream and they spawn at the same at different times, that'd be another way of isolating two populations. So there's lots of ways that you can get reproductive isolation. They can be, like I said, behavioral, temporal, uh, spatial, and then you can even have what's called a post-zygotic reprodu uh, um, reproductive isolation. In post-zygotic, you actually mate and you actually form an offspring. But that offspring, that hybrid might have an uneven number of chromosomes. So they're sterile. Think of like a mule 
or they might be uh, gimpy and they have really low fitness and don't live very long. So the post I got it because you actually have a fertilization event, but that um, offspring doesn't do very well, doesn't reproduce again. Okay. Can you explain how sexual selection may have been a factor in sympatric speciation of late Victorian cichlids? <clears throat> That's a good question. So basically, sexual selection, you know, think about it this way. Females, in this case, are selecting males for certain traits. And in the lakes, Victoria cichlids, there was this rapid diversification. And historically, that lake was pretty clear. So the females could see different colors on the males. So what would happen is you would get all this rampant sexual selection or these females were choosing males for different uh, traits. And it was almost certainly repeated disruptive selection leading to all these males with different colors. And that's one of the ways that uh, we think that there was rapid speciation in the late Victorian cichlids. The other thing, I'm going to mention it here also, it was a combination of this uh, pharyngeal jaws that they have. Remember the jaws within a jaw? And those pharyngeal jaws opened up a lot of different niches for these fish. So combined with sexual selection and the pharyngeal jaws, they were able to exploit a lot of different niches. And of course, they um, they had this, this sexual selection as well. Okay, somebody wants me to do an example of a Hardy-Weinberg calculation. I'm going to hold off on that one right here because I don't have a chalkboard in front of me. What I will do is I will, when I end this, I will create a quick video on a hardy, on a very simple Hardy-Weinberg equ um, equilibrium problem, one that you're going to have on your test tomorrow. So I will, I will do that after I finish this, where I can, uh, I can get a chalkboard and and actually do it right, and not try to hold up a piece of paper. Sorry, I'm in the middle of moving, so my office is kind of, um, I don't have my chalkboard with me, but I'll do that. Okay, here's a really good question. Could you explain the requirements for a, a good hypothesis? Now, first of all, always remember this, this is a pet peeve of mine. A hypothesis is not an educated guess. Hypotheses are a proposed explanation for a set of observations, or they make some prediction of an outcome. It's a much harder thing to understand than an educated guess. I don't know what an educated guess is. I'm not guessing. I'm, I'm proposing an outcome or, or, or predicting or making a prediction. But any good hypothesis should at least be testable and potentially falsifiable. Now, it might, we might not have the technology to test it. We might not have the money to test it. Uh, it might be unethical to test it. You know, you, you, can't, uh, you can't, like, take a human population and make them drink a six-pack of beer, eat pizza every week to understand how that's going to affect our health, right? So that manipulated experiment would not be good. But in theory, you could still test it. So once again, hypothesis should be at least testable and potentially falsifiable. Okay, I got another one for Hardy Weinberg. I, and for those of you that are interested in Hardy Weinberg, look, there is a lot of information out there how to do Hardy Weinberg. So if um, so, if my explanation that I'm going to post doesn't work for you guys, uh, there there is like crash course. There is Khan Academy. And if you just type in Hardy Weinberg problems, you'll get, oh my gosh, you'll get PDF after PDF after PDF of these teachers putting out uh, homework problems on uh, on how to calculate Hardy Weinberg. So there's lots and lots of information out there for you guys. But don't worry, I'll put out one for you too. Okay, can you please explain the evolutionary origins of sexual reproduction and the origin of two sexes? Okay. First thing, um, I actually have an entire video. It's called Five Things They Didn't You Didn't Know About Mitochondria. And I talk about it in that video, which for uh, Bio um, 303, I actually posted that for you. But really quickly, to understand the origins of sexual reproduction, you have to know what sexual reproduction is. Sexual reproduction is when you have two organisms that create gametes. So you have a fusion, a fusion of gametes that are haploid, usually, they come together to form a new organism, right? So you're, you're combining two genomes to make a new organism. So you get a copy of your genome from your mom, you get a copy from your dad. And then, like I said, you've got 46. That's sexual reproduction. If you're not doing that, it's not sexual reproduction. <clears throat> so 
why do we do that? You know, why in the world would you have uh, sexual reproduction when you could just reproduce asexually? Like, oh, times are good. Let's reproduce. You know, it turns out that if you think about it, we have two copies of our genome. Well, early on, uh, eukaryotes formed by the merger of two prokaryotes. And one of those prokaryotes evolved into becoming the mitochondria. And they do aerobic respiration. Well, aerobic respiration is great. I mean, it produces all this ATP. You can become larger. You can become more complex because you've got way more energy available to you. But there's a cost. And that cost is aerobic respiration uses oxygen. And that oxygen, what it does is it oxidizes stuff. It it damages your cellular membranes. It damages your um, your proteins. And in fact, part of our aging is oxidative stress and it damages your DNA. So if you're a mitochondria and you're hanging out inside your host cell and you're kind of you know, creating all these reactive oxygen species, ROSs, and um, you're damaging your DNA, if you damage the wrong gene, the cell dies and you go down with it. But if you have two copies of your genome, if you damage one particular gene, you are likely to have another functioning gene. So that's why we think uh, sexual reproduction evolved was so that you could have two copies of a genome in an organism. So that if one became damaged because of the mitochondria doing aerobic respiration, you could have another functioning gene. And you can also use that functioning gene to repair the damaged one. Now, the origin of two sexes, if you think about this, your mitochondria come from your mom, come from the egg. And in fact, that's a condition across almost all eukaryotes. You've got the tiny little male gamete, the sperm, and you get this monstrous egg full of all the organelles, cytoplasm, and the mitochondria. Well, mitochondria reproduce by binary fission, asexually. That means when your mom has an egg and it's full of like almost a million mitochondria, they're all clones of each other. They're not competing with each other for space or resources. But if you were to combine two gametes and combine the two different mitochondria, then those mitochondria would be a different, they wouldn't be related to each other. So they would compete with each other for resources. And you would go from a, a plus plus relationship to potentially a, a, a negative relationship as the mitochondria compete for resources. So in the early evolution of eukaryotes, it evolved that you have two mating types, which we call male and female. So that the mitochondria only come from one lineage and not another, so that the mitochondria don't um, compete with unrelated mitochondria for um, resources. Okay. Why is lateral gene transfer so important to evolution? Well, for one, when it comes to bacteria, oh my gosh, they're swapping genes all over the place. And one of the ways that um, antibiotic resistant diseases spread so rapidly is because they can pick up the gene for um, antibiotic resistance from the environment. I mean, they don't even have to evolve it. They can pick it up from the environment. And, and so that's really important for that. When it comes to mammals and humans specifically, or actually any organism, we get lateral gene transfer and we'll get it a lot of times from viruses. So between five and 8% of your genome is virus, a viral origin. And uh, we don't often know what all of that viral DNA is doing in our genome. We think some of it has to do with uh, improving our immune system. We can use uh, viral, dead viral genomes in our body to recognize other viruses and attack them. That's what bacteria do. But interestingly, uh, some retrovirus early in the history of mammals, uh, gave us a gene called to make a protein called synictin. And what that protein does is it allows the placenta to embed into the endometrium of the uterus. So if you think about that, part of the way that mammals evolved a live birth by having a placenta, that we got one of the crucial genes for that from a virus. You know, it didn't just evolve over time, like from our ancestors, from our parents and passed down. No, this thing came from a virus. We acquired that. So interestingly, viral infections and, and or viruses inserting their genomes into mammals over the course of millions of years has affected our evolution of the placenta. And like I said, we don't know the full extent of how that has happened, but definitely has affected the evolution of mammals. Okay.
why is gene duplication important for evolution? All right. Okay. First of all, I want to say evolution is not progressive. That being said, evolution has progressively created more and more complex animals. Uh, I mean, humans, I know we're another animal, but we are probably the most complex animal that's ever existed for multiple reasons, and especially vertebrates, um, and especially like uh, amniotes, which include reptiles, amphibians, and then a lot of the fish you're familiar with. We're, we're incredibly complex organisms. The way we're able to become more complex over time is through gene duplication. When a gene duplicates, and this happens in like meiosis one where you get uneven crossing over, you, you can get two copies of a gene and where you only had one copy. Well, now both those genes can mutate randomly and are under natural selection. So gene duplication leads to gene families and gene families allow us to do more and more things. For instance, um, our ability to detect odors in the environment is a result of a gene duplication of over a thousand times allowing us to detect numerous uh, scents in the environment. Uh, our eyesight, if you've ever heard that dogs are mostly colorblind, well, they're not truly really colorblind. They don't see as many colors as we do. But the reason why primates can see such good color is because early on in our, in our evolutionary history, there was a gene duplication that allowed us to see a lot more colors. So that's why gene duplication is very important because it allows for increased amounts of DNA in your body that or uh, an increased number of genes allowing you to do more and more things. Okay. So will you please go over mitochondria how influence of function, the formation of two sexes. Okay, I just went over that a second ago. And also um, I've got a video, I've got several videos I've posted on how like evolution or the evolution of sexes was caused by the mitochondria and also about endosymbiosis as well. Okay, can you please explain frequency dependent selection? Okay, so frequency dependent selection. That means that natural selection is gonna select an allele based on its frequency in the population. Let me give you an example. Um, if you remember um, those black um, gambusia, the, the, the males, they occur in about one to 5% of the population. When they're rare, when the, the, when the alleles to make them dark are rare, they are selected for. And then as they become more common in the population, they are selected against. So the, whether or not they're selected for or against is a, is, is a function of their frequency. Another example of frequency dependent selection, um, think of sickle cell anemia and sickle cell disease. Okay, in Africa and throughout parts of uh, very tropical regions of the world, but specifically Africa, uh, malaria is horrible. It's the number one killer of humans. And there's, if you're, if you're heterozygous, if you carry one copy of the sickle cell allele, then you have some resistance to malaria. Okay, now if you're homozygous for sickle cell, that's really, really, really bad. So here's frequency dependent. If the sickle cell allele becomes too common in the population, then the rate of homozygosity for that, or the rate of sickle cell disease increases, and then it's selected against. However, once the frequency goes down and becomes more rare, because it's very rare, and the instance of people developing sickle cell disease because they're homozygous, getting two copies of that allele, becomes less common, then the uh, allele is now selected for. So over time, what happens is this. It, it kind of oscillates. So if you can see this right here, over time, the, uh, the frequency of that allele oscillates. So when it's rare in the population, and when the frequency is low, it's selected for. And then when it gets common, it's now selected against and goes down in frequency. So that would be an example of frequency-dependent selection. <clears throat> oh, thank you for your for taking the time to do this. Well, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you guys are uh, joining in and asking all these questions. This is uh, this is great. I love doing this for you guys. Okay, what are what are source and sync populations? I covered that uh, 
early on in this chapter, actually. So if you'll go back to like the first 20 minutes or so, I'll, it has source sync populations, but very quickly, some populations are uh, really, really good. They're in prime habitat and sync populations. They might be populations that are not in that great of a habitat. And what will happen is uh, the source populations will produce more individuals that can survive there. So they will, they will migrate out of those source populations and go to like these other populations that might be in like kind of suboptimal habitat. And then that would be a sink. And the whole point is, is if you cut off um, uh, flow from a source to a sink, you might lose your sink populations over time. <clears throat> Can you explain what is meant by adaptive radiation? Okay, so adaptive radiation, one way, whenever you see a, a um, let me give you guys a help. Whenever you see a, a term, something like adaptive radiation, go to the all-knowing, all-powerful Google or Wikipedia and just type it in and it'll pop right up for you. But basically, adaptive radiation is when an organism, an ancestor, rapidly diversifies into many different species uh, for various reasons. Often it's to exploit new ecological niches. So for example, after the dinosaurs went extinct, mammals, well, I think we're finding more evidence they were more diverse than we thought. But let's let's pretend for a second mammals weren't that 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 diverse when the dinosaurs went extinct. And without the dinosaurs around, mammals underwent rapid adaptive radiation. They they rapidly diversified to fill many different niches. The cichlids in Lake Victoria that is another example of a rapid um, adaptive radiation where they they um, rapidly uh, speciated to fill new niches in that lake. Like some are eating scales of other fish, some are eating mollusks, some are eating small snails, you name it. Okay. The three outcomes of bringing diverged species back together. Okay. <clears throat> so let's say we have, let me get another piece of paper here. And let's say we've got a population. This is our population right here. This is just a population. And then that population, we're going to diverge that population. That pin doesn't work at all. Okay, so now this population, we're going to say it diverges. And it doesn't really matter why it diverges. We could have a, a geographical barrier uh, comes in. You can imagine, like, I have a lake, and that lake dried up. So you could imagine I've got a lake. That would be one population here. And you get all these, like, little fish in here. Um, yeah, I think I'm drawing a little Pac-Mans here. Okay, we got all these um, Pac-Mans here in this one lake. So what happens is this lake dries up, and now I've got two lakes, and this population is now split in two. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. These populations will begin to diverge over time. You're, you're just going to – it could be through natural selection. It could be through sexual selection. It could just be through genetic drift. These populations will diverge over time. And what will happen is uh, they will continue to diverge. And then you can imagine a scenario in time where like this, you get into a much wetter time, thousands of years later, and it becomes wetter. And now I've got one lake again, because these, this fills up and now you've got one lake. And these two populations here now intermingle. Well, the question is, well, what happens? And that depends on several things. One of them is, how different did they diverge? So if they diverged a lot, you'll get reinforcement. The, the two populations will continue to evolve down their evolutionary trajectories. So could, their, their separation, their speciation could be enforced. It could be, uh, you know, one decided I'm going to eat small fish and the other one is going to eat snails. And they're going to never come back together again. You could get... Um, <clears throat> the two populations come back together. In this case, there's not enough divergence between the two populations, so they just mingle right back into one um, species. And, uh, you know, that's, that's happening in Lake Victoria, for instance. What's happening is that you had rampant sexual selection, so these females were choosing males for different color patterns on them, and they weren't choosing males with other color patterns. So we could there was a, a barrier to gene flow, so we identified them as unique species. However, when the water became turbid due to 
you know, sediment in it and, and phytoplankton blooms, the females couldn't see the males anymore very well. So they started hybridizing again. And basically this species hybridized back into one species. So in that case, the two populations came together and, and back into one species. And then you could also have a balance. And you could maintain the, the two populations are balanced, but they no longer, they're not continuing to diverge anymore because you're creating hybrids like this. And, uh, you know, we might be seeing that in some of the bird examples I showed you, for instance, um, those juncos, I, I, I love the juncos and I keep showing like the, the um, pink sided, the gray headed, slate colored and the Oregon juncos, uh, you know, they look very different, but they might have just enough hybridization between them that's keeping that those juncos from diversifying into a completely different species. So they're just going to stay as the Oregon junco, the pink sided junco, slate color and gray headed. And they're just gonna stay in those different forms without continuing to diverge. So those are the three things that can happen. Okay. Can you explain the modern synthesis and how it combines Darwin and Mendelian genetics? Well, I'm glad you asked that. That's gonna be on the test. Basically what's gonna happen is, you know, Darwin, when he came up with evolution by natural selection, there were these criticisms. What's your source of variation? Because if there's no new variation in a population, then evolution would select for whatever worked and then it would stop without any new variation. And at the time, the other big criticism was, well, wait a second. If, um, if there's this blending inheritance, think blending inheritance, yellow and blue mean green. If there happened to be some benefit or beneficial trait, it would quickly get swamped out in a population. Okay, so those are the criticisms. Mendel, in his P experiment, disproved blending inheritance. He showed that you have these genes, you have these variations of a gene, you inherit those variations called alleles from each parent, and um, he disproved it and he showed the particulate inheritance. An allele is an actual thing in a population. It's like if we were to go into um, the classroom and we figured out everybody's blood type, we could get a frequency of those of how many A alleles, B alleles, and O alleles there are in the classroom because an allele is an actual thing. So, and then uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan discovered that you know genes are found on chromosomes. He discovered that mutations create new alleles. Okay, so here we go. We got Darwin's slow change over time. We know this the, the evolution has changed over time, but we defined evolution as a change in allele frequency in a population from one generation to the next. Okay, over one generation to the next, sorry. So what that means is modern synthesis is taking Gregor Mendel's uh, particulate inheritance, and uh, we know that new alleles cause, are caused by mutations, and we're able to define evolution from a genetic point of view, right? And that's what the modern synthesis did. It was able to look at and, and define evolution at a population level based on changes in the, in the genes of that population. That's what's really important about the modern synthesis is it combined both of, uh, of genetics and Darwin's thinking into one cohesive theory. Okay, punctuated equilibrium versus gradualism. Well, gradualism is things slow. Darwin thought that evolution was this slow grinding change by natural selection. And it took millions and millions and millions of years. Punctuated equilibrium. That's by uh, Stephen Jay Gould. And he was like, you know, sometimes evolution could be really fast. And he proposed this idea that evolution could go, um, it, it, it could go like this. It could go, it's kind of like going along, not very fast, not very fast. And then something in the environment changes, like mass extinction and rapid diversification, rapid evolution, followed by a period of slow evolutionary change. So the idea is that evolution could go really, really fast and then slow down. So rather than evolution always being slow and kind of going along at the same rate, it's like, no, evolution can go fast and then slow. And that's the, the difference between punctuated equilibrium and gradualism. Okay. 
can you touch on the benefits of inbreeding? There are a lot of consequences, but what are the what about the benefits? You know, that's a that's a great question. It's kind of hard actually. Inbreeding, um, we all know the consequences of it. Just go watch Joffrey on, on uh, you know on Game of Thrones, right? That's a consequence of inbreeding. But uh, basically, one of the benefits of inbreeding is that with like plants and things, you can actually get rid of a deleterious allele. Um, it's kind of random. I mean, you get them all in one individual and and get rid of that individual plant. And basically, you've taken out all those deleterious alleles. So that's one of the ways that inbreeding is good. It's kind of random, though, and that's a problem with that. Okay. It looks like I don't have any more questions. It's been about an hour. Uh, man, I thanks for showing up, guys. If anybody has another last-minute question, shoot really quick. But I think I'm going to sign off. This will be posted on YouTube. And it will also be posted on UNM Learn for you guys. And uh, thank you for, I'll have a good one too, but I got one more. Provide two examples of how lateral gene transfer can influence evolution. I hit that a few minutes ago. Uh, think about antibiotic resistance and bacteria and the evolution of mammals. Okay, guys, well, thank you. And uh, I will see you tomorrow. Study hard. I know some of your TAs have uh, some um, office hours today, and I'm actually in my office today for about another hour and a half. All right. Yeah, thank you, guys, and uh, see you tomorrow, and good luck.